and let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully you guys can see my screen coming through okay. Um, so today we're going to get into diuretics and I, diuretics are something I feel like we should have better ownership of. I think they're always deferred to the cardiologist to play with them and to use diuretic therapy. And from my own experience, I don't have a lot of consultation with the cardiologists if they are running into difficulty or diuretic resistance. Um, and I'm sure other people might have different experiences, but you know, we should really be the masters of the nephron, uh, queen of the nephron, some of us might even have as a title. Uh, so we should really be able to understand how we can modify diuretic therapy, how we can use the various parts of the nephron to enhance the diuretic effect. And frankly, I think that we can do that better than cardiologists because they are not thinking in terms of proximal versus loop versus distal tubule, just like I'm not thinking about uh, whatever the squiggly lines on the B mode of an echo was. And that's probably not even the right mode. I don't even know, but I'm not paying attention much to that. And they're not paying much attention to the sections of the nephron. And co collectively, we can probably figure out how to manage heart and kidney disease better. But I think this is an area that could have better crosstalk between specialties and for us to really play our role in that, we, we really need to be stepping up and being uh, comfortable in that role of being the, the masters of the nephron and being able to be really comfortable with recommending different diuretic approaches because certainly Lasix is not the best choice for everybody or you know, maybe it's the right choice for most patients to begin with, but it will suddenly, it will not be at some point or we need additional therapies. So. That was really the point of these two articles that we had, and I didn't want to just review diuretics and where they work. There are plenty of good resources for that. I think there's an entire chapter in Rose's book, and there are, you know, you can, there's chapters in DBART. I mean, any textbook is going to have a review of where each of the diuretics work and what their mechanism is. But I wanted to try to make it a bit more clinical, and so this was a really cool series that came out in C. Jason. I think it ran from 2019 into 2020, and it was nephropharmacology for the clinician. And they talked about a lot of different therapies and uh, kind of drug categories and how nephrologists need to be aware and be comfortable with it. And I thought this was just a really nice review about diuretic use because it really brought into the picture some of the clinical syndromes that we're using them for and how the PK is not going to be the same in those scenarios. It brings up the idea of giving Lasix and a whole bunch of other stuff simultaneously. So I thought it would be a, a great place to introduce since our last topic was talking about sodium handling along the nephron. Now we're talking about how we are going to uh, intervene and cause that sodium handling to become abnormal to obtain our desired effect that we're trying to do. Um, so that is the point of this week's articles. Um, this one that we'll start with about just using diuretics and then the second one is an introduction, nice overview of the furosemide stress test, which is a uh, way that maybe a diuretic response could give us some prognostic information for a patient. So I thought that that was a, an interesting thing to review as well, too. Um, okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started with this first article, the one on clinical pharmacology of diuretic use. Uh, why don't we just start it by, start by opening up to any questions we had, uh, anyone had about this article, any areas that folks wanted to start discussing or things that they just did not feel comfortable with going through. Good good morning. Um, this is Caesar. Um, as you as you highlight there in the furosemide 
bioavailability uh, mm -hmm. in in humans it says it's approximately 50 percent is that correct mm -hmm. and i don't know in dogs I, I couldn't find that so do we know uh, what is that number in dogs yeah that's a good question and i actually tried to pull that from some papers as well too um, so there is an old paper that I found the bioavailability in dogs was better. Um, so they found it to be about 77% bioavailable um, compared to 50% in people. So it seems like dogs absorb it a bit better. Um, it seems like torsamide is very similar, that it's very bioavailable, between 92 to 99% bioavailable in dogs. but the Lasix is a bit better absorbed in dogs compared to people. When I searched in cats to see if there was any data on oral bioavailability of ferrosamide in cats, it showed zero publications in PubMed. So I don't know if that is something that's been studied. So it seems like our patients absorb Lasix a bit better. Um, I think those are normal dogs that the study was in and that probably makes a difference when we try to use some of these recommendations that were made. Um, so I think just here below, they're saying on, on the basis of bioavailability, when they're switching, when you're switching a patient in hospital who's received, let's say, you know, 10 milligrams of Lasix twice a day IV, the suggestion in people, because it's only 50% bioavailable, is to send that human home on 20 milligrams of Lasix orally twice a day. And they're saying double it because it's only 50% bioavailable. So based upon the bioavailability in dogs being 70-ish percent, maybe you could increase the dose by 50% rather than double. So maybe if, if a dog's on 10 milligrams twice a day IV in the hospital, maybe 15 milligrams orally twice a day would be a similar dose that they're going to receive, but probably not doubling it if it is true that all dogs have better bioavailability of furosemide than people do. I think kind of going along with that, I thought it was interesting that one of the proposed mechanisms for why the dose does need to be increased in patients with, you know, renal disease or liver disease might be that they have edema of their GI tract leading also to decreased absorption. And I have to say that's not something that I usually take into consideration with those patients, even, you know, patients with a PLN where arguably maybe they do even have more gastric or GI tract edema. So I was just curious to see if that is something you guys often take into consideration with those patients with your drugs at all, and, and maybe more arguably for IV over oral medications. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think maybe it's in this article or maybe it's in the next one. There is a table that lists all the potential reasons. It's the, it's the other one. Let me just... Sorry to make anybody seasick with the rapid moving around, um, but we'll, we'll come back to this paper. But just to highlight that, um, in the table one of the second article that we're going to discuss today, when it lists reasons for why Lasix might not work well, your azotemic edematous PLN dog is probably the patient that is going to have the least likelihood to be effective because they're hypoalbuminemic, so there's less furosemide that's going to go to the nephron. They're often edematous, so they are having decreased oral bioavailability. They might, especially if they have an AKI on top of it, many of those patients could be oliguric, so they're having retained um, plasma levels that could become toxic. They're uremic, so their uremic acids are going to compete with O1 and O3, which transported from the basolateral side, from the basorectal capillaries into the proximal tubular cells. They have a uremic metabolic acidosis, which does the same thing as well, too. So those patients are, have probably the, the least likelihood that it's going to work, bioavailability certainly being one of those factors. And 
probably of that, the only one that we can obviously change is the bioavailability. So giving intravenous Lasix to those patients is likely going to be more effective or probably subcutaneous Lasix if it's outpatient, but you still have to worry about subcutaneous perfusion and absorption there. But that, but definitely, I, I think that that's something that we need to consider. To be honest, I don't use a lot of Lasix orally in my patients. If, if they're edematous from nephrotic syndrome, I don't use a lot of Lasix for that. I, and um, you know, Shelly can give some insight, but certainly the iris consensus statement suggests using loop diuretics as our initial therapy for that. And I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan because I think it's a very fine line between trying to take those patients from being overhydrated to being normal to overshooting and making them volume depleted and then causing problems. So I tend to I manage think, my edema of nephrotic syndrome with other diuretics personally. Yeah, that discussion happened. Yeah, so I'm have to remember it because it's like over 10 years ago, right, that the discussion happened. But it, I think that the furosemide is primarily recommended if, if animals were in respiratory distress. But if they weren't, then you would use like spironolactone or something like that. Um, you know, so fluid removal, furosemide, if respiratory distress, but otherwise you're going to use a milder diuretic is how I recall it. But I'd have to go back and read it per se. And that's the way I would approach it clinically. And the overhydrated AKI patients, it's going to be IV. And by the time they're okay for oral medications, they're, they probably don't need the diuretic anymore. Right. Hopefully. Right. And I think but it's still good to know. With that, it, it also brings up that idea, which wasn't really talked about here, about how we even administer Lasix intravenously. And they're, they talk about the mechanisms, and I think it's maybe at the end of this paper, they have that stepwise protocol, and they say about what their bolus is and then what their CRI rate is. That's table three towards the end. And I think we have one manuscript of LASIK CRIs. I think it's in greyhounds, which I've always argued that greyhounds are probably not a good dog to represent all dogs because they're just so abnormal in their own right. But uh, one manuscript showing that LASIK CRI pr produced a more profound diuresis than bolus therapy. But remember, those are normal dogs. And perhaps in your patient with congestive heart failure, a CRI of Lasix might be a, a beneficial approach. But when we're talking specifically about our overhydrated patients with AKI, I think a, a CRI is appropriate if you have response. Um, so errors that I've seen, even in my own hospital, is patients will be given a dose of Lasix because the patient's anuric, overhydrated, azotemic, and it doesn't work. They don't make any urine. And then they're put on a CRI of it. And it doesn't really make much sense because that Lasix that you just gave them, it's still there. <laughs> so um, it's still circulating. Lasix is at least 50% metabolized by the kidneys and dogs. So we're relying on hepatic elimination. Um, but in people, it's been shown that it's 100% eliminated by the kidneys and metabolized by the kidneys, and that's probably more true. So if you haven't, if your kidneys haven't gotten rid of it, that bolus that you've given is still there. Now, if you didn't give a high enough dose, so if your creatinine is 10 and you're making a drop of urine an hour and you give them one mg per kg as your dose, well, that's probably not sufficient. And I know we're jumping around a little bit, but that goes to the tables that they had here um, for figure three, that you likely need to give them a higher dose of the drug in order to obtain that effect. And that's because you're not getting a lot of that drug to the active site. But if you gave a reasonable dose as a bolus and the patient doesn't respond, that drug is still there. Putting them on a CRI afterwards 
will do nothing. The point of the CRI is to replace the Lasix that's being excreted so that they stay at a steady state. If it's not being excreted, you still have it. So putting them on a CRI is not going to be beneficial at all. And you probably get more of the Lasix getting to the thick ascending limb of Henley's loop from a bolus where they have a higher quantity in their plasma rather than a trickle by giving them the CRI. Um, so CRIs are probably only useful if our patients respond to it. And that's specifically for our, when we're treating our patients with hypervolemia and oligoanuria. Um, patients with congestive heart failure and preserved kidney function, uh, CRI might work very, very well to eliminate it, but that's because they respond. Their kidneys are presumably normal, they have the diuresis, and the CRI is going to replace the Lasix that's excreted. That's a much different scenario than what we're treating our patients with hypervolemia and oligoanuria, when we're specifically giving Lasix to convert them to become polyuric or to try to eliminate that extra volume. I guess just going to that point then, to me, it was crazy how high of doses humans are using in these patients, especially I think paradoxically, you think, oh, it's an azotemic patient, I shouldn't load them with furosemide, but they're encouraging the opposite. But then I guess my question would be, what clinical dose are should we be recommending for these oligaric patients then, assuming the standard one mg per kg isn't going to work? Yeah, really good question. So people seem to be very sensitive to Lasix. Um, the dose that people get for a mg per kg basage is much lower than a dog. So it's quite common that people will be on 10 to 20 milligrams of Lasix per dose, and they might get that twice a day. But if you think about it, 20 milligrams, even presuming an 80 kilogram person, that's a quarter mg per kg. I mean, that's nothing for what we would give to a dog or a cat. And a very common approach in people is to multiply their dose or a normal dose of LASIK. Let's say that they would normally give 20 milligrams IV to a person, which is a pretty standard dose for a human. Um, you multiply it by their creatinine when they have AKI up to a ceiling dose typically of about 80 unless they've already shown diuretic resistance. So that means that the creatinine is four, instead of giving them 20 milligrams, you would give them 80 milligrams. Now, I haven't gone that far to multiply things by their creatinine, but if your patient has a creatinine of eight and they're oligoanuric, it's probable that the two mg per kg dose is not going to have an effect. And personally, I wouldn't start less than two if I was trying to convert my oligoanuric patient. I probably would start with a two mg per kg dose, and if that didn't work in an hour, I would probably repeat it. I don't think I would personally give more than a cumulative dose of maybe six or eight mg per kg because certainly we we can see and it's been reported that patients can develop ototoxicity, I think even at the eight mg per kg dose. So if they're not seeing, if we're not seeing a response, we probably are just not going to see one at that level. But I mean, looking at some of these, the doses that they're getting and the oral doses that they're receiving, um, that's typically patients that are in congestive heart failure that have had multiple episodes. You're not typically seeing humans that are requiring 240 milligrams of Lasix per day for their first time decongestion unless they have pretty dramatic um, myocardial infarction or they have ruptured a cord or something like that. So I personally, I, I, I think two mg per kg is the minimum that I would use and I would feel pretty comfortable even giving three or four mg per kg as a bolus to see if they're going to have a response to it to see if we're going to get urine that's going to be produced in the first hour or two after they receive it. Um, but I, I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't times it by their creatinine. I just, that, that's my personal approach is just to bump it up. I don't know what everyone else is doing. Yes. So uh, let, let me clarify, you would give an IV bolus of two mix per kg, uh, 
-hmm. And if there's no urine two hours later, you would give an additional two MIGs for a total dose of four MIGs, or mm -hmm. you would give four MIGs that second time around for a total dose of six MIGs per kg in yeah. that hour. Personally, yeah, that and that's about what I would, and then I, I, I'd be done with it. I'd be like, okay, well, they're not going to respond to Lasix today. Maybe as their kidneys heal and recover two days from now, they will, but giving more isn't going to do anything. Um, but if their creatinine is 10, their GFR is, is tiny. And I think this is certainly amongst our ER doctors that are typically treating the congestive heart failures or managing these oligoanuric patients overnight before we get them the next day, people don't recognize that it's not the blood concentration of Lasix that matters. It's the concentration inside the, in, inside the loop and it has to be actively secreted and a minimal amount is actually filtered because it's protein bound. So if your proximal tubules don't work, you're not going to get much of the drug to the site of action. If your tubules are obstructed because they're cast, the drug's not going to get there. So you need to give enough to overcome the minuscule amount of secretion so that you can actually get some of the drug to the site of activity because it's not the blood concentration, it's the tubular concentration. So yeah, that, that's my approach um, for what I've done for those patients. But I will also admit that I generally find that Lasix is ineffective in converting an oligoenuric patient to become polyuric. Oh yeah, for sure. In so I, if, if, if dialysis is an option, I'm not even going to waste time with it. I'm not even gonna risk dealing with lots of Lasix or ototoxicity or anything. I'm just gonna think about dialyzing that patient, but certainly that's not an option for everybody. And some clients aren't gonna be able to afford it and then you have to kind of throw everything at them. Um, and then Lasix, that, that is my typical approach for using Lasix in those patients. Unless it's late at night and then I'm going to try that Lasix to see what happens in the morning. Sure. Right. <laughs> Unless the dialysis fellow is on call and can come in that night to dialyze. Right. Then no Lasix. Yeah. But and we have that scenario too, but that's also like, that's a, not a fun anesthesia to place a catheter in as well too. So I would probably still give that patient, you know, if they're, oxygen dependent because they're so overloaded, I'm still going to try Lasix, even if dialysis is an option, because if I can get some volume off of them, then they might be a better anesthesia candidate. Or remember, Lasix is a pulmonary venodilator. So the rapid response we see with respiratory improvement with Lasix is not just due to their diuresis. In fact, it's not at all due to their diuresis. When you give a, a patient with in congestive heart failure Lasix and they're breathing better in 30 minutes, they haven't urinated yet. It's because it causes significant vasodilation in the pulmonary uh, veins, I believe, and you have lessening of your pulmonary hypertension. You start to get some of that fluid that comes out. So even in aneuric patients, Lasix can be helpful for respiratory distress. And in fact, people who have COPD and they're on dialysis, and most humans that are on chronic dialysis are aneuric, will still be given Lasix for clinical improvement of their COPD symptoms because of that vasodilation that occurs. So I probably would still use Lasix in that patient, even if that makes them maybe tolerate their sedation slash anesthesia better to get that catheter in um, because yeah, that overloaded patient in oxygen is not one that my anesthesia team is very thrilled <laughs> to knock out so that we can, uh, we can place the catheter in and we can start treating them. But ultimately that's often what they need in order to get that volume off. Any other questions? Things that were confusing on, on this article? Just um, yeah, go for it. Let me ask you guys one thing just for curiosity. Like just drawing like a, a worse scenario when you have uh, 
a chronic uh, heart failure dog that it's that is already taking I don't know two milligrams or per kilogram um, of furosemide, and then he he becomes oliguric. What what would be the first uh, trigger of a uh, increment dose for for such patient? What 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 would would be your starting dose for these patients that are already chronic in uh, diuretics prescriptions? Would you double or just a yeah? Quarter? Yeah, I would I would double it, but I guess the first question I'd have is why are they now oligonuric? Is it because they have progressive cardiac failure and they have decreased perfusion and that's why we're having decreased urine output? Or are they developing just resistance to Lasix? And they talked about it in this article, which I thought was really interesting when they talked about the time of activity of Lasix, where you have a period of diuresis and an anti-diuresis, and the effects are of Lasix are quite short, and but you can lose so much sodium and water during that time when the kidneys can respond and perform anti-diuresis afterwards. In a 12-hour time span, you still end up with a net fluid loss. Um, so that's what they call this post-diuretic sodium chloride retention. And so if the patient was having less diuretic effects because they were becoming resistant, and this article talks about all the reasons that you can have resistance, just chronic usage. Um, you can have changes of the distal tubules uh, sodium affinity. You can have the patient become uremic, metabolic acidosis, all of those things that are there. If it's not from a forward pump problem with the heart, I would acutely increase the dose of Lasix, but I would also start recruiting other areas of the nephron. And they talk in here about using a distal uh, tubular uh, diuretic to get an additional effect. So they talk about a little bit of giving spironolactone in some of those patients. And I think many of our heart failure patients are started on spironolactone after they leave the hospital. But I had included as just a bonus article this recent New England Journal of Medicine manuscript that came out just, I think, last month, and it yeah. was the use of acetazolamide. So acetazolamide, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, so remember, that's going to be a proximal tubular diuretic, not distal. So mm -hmm. one of the concepts is if you put them on a distal tubular diuretic, like spironolactone, amylaride, triamterene, you can help overcome the distal sodium affinity, but this is using a proximal tubular uh, diuretic in combination with Lasix. And what they found is that people became more significantly decongested when acetazolamide was added. And to me, I, just, I, I don't manage the heart failure patients in, in the hospital. I hear about them every day on our, our rounds and where they're at, but I don't, here of our emergency service turning towards any other drug other than Lasix for patients that are in heart failure, or if they are coming in their refractory, they might turn from Lasix, and that's maybe when they might turn towards torsamide and use torsamide. But remember, torsamide is just a, a more potent form of diuretic than Lasix. It has the same channel that it's bound to. So you, you could just be essentially giving them torsamide is the equivalent of giving them a whopping dose of Lasix potentially. Uh, but using some other drugs would probably be what that patient would also need. So I, in, in your example, Andrea, I probably would give them a, a double dose of Lasix, take them from the two mg per kg, give them four, see what happens, but then also consider some other site along the nephron, proximally with acetylzolamide or distally with some other type of diuretic there to see if we can get better diuresis that might occur. That, that'd be my personal approach. Thank you. So I didn't expect anyone to read through this article. I just thought it was very, very timely as we went through our diuretics.
Uh, what were some other things that I thought was interesting in this article? I had a quick question real quick, JD. Yeah, go for it. Um, so this goes back to the physiology and PK a little bit, which you already touched on, but I was kind of hung up um, on the 50% of Lasix being eliminated by glucuronidation part of this paper. Cause I mean, we talked about already that dogs eliminate more from the kidneys, but is that true for, for cats too? I was just a little yeah. confused because of the fact that cats are like reportedly more sensitive, which would make sense if it's hepatically metabolized and they don't really have that metabolism, but generally right. we see like the same labeled doses. Yeah, I think that's a great question because we all know that cats are pretty poor at glucuronidation and I'm not aware and I, I didn't dive into that specifically. I only had looked specifically at cats for the oral bioavailability of Lasix, but I can try to dig in and see if I can find any other articles that really looks at the metabolism and elimination of Lasix in cats because if they don't metabolize it well because they don't perform glucuronidation as well as dogs and as well as people, then the likely event would be the half-life of furosemide would be longer. If you're, you have less metabolism, you're relying more than on just elimination. And if those transporters that, remember, you have OAT1 and OAT3, so those are their transporters along the basolateral side of your proximal tubular cells, those are the transporters that are pulling it from the basorectal capillaries into the proximal tubular cells. So your organic anion transporter 1 and 3, OAT1 and 3, and then it's uh, the multidrug, Pump three, I think, is the one of the actually sec secretory pumps that are there on the apical surface. Um, so if you have saturation there, then it's going to take time for those transporters to be able to pull the Lasix out. So if cats aren't metabolizing it at the same time, more Lasix is going to be circulating. Those transporters might be saturated, so the half life would be prolonged. So that's probably why in cats we might start with lower dosages and see a, the similar clinical effect. I think giving like one or one and a half mg per kg is a pretty common dose that many cats will receive and where dogs might get bumped up to two to four mg per kg, cats are probably a bit lower and maybe they need less because of the lower Metabol metabolic rate they might have of it. But I'll have to dig into that more. I personally haven't seen a paper on that. I don't know if anybody else has, but I, I didn't specifically look. Thanks. But great call. Certainly cats are poor glucuronidators. Absolutely. Um, the only other things I wanted to comment on here because they talked about it very, very briefly, but it is in vogue some, with some human nephrologists. Uh, you, you see them talk about this sometimes on the ASN boards about giving Lasix with albumin. And because Lasix is protein bound, that by giving it with albumin, you're basically giving it already with its carrier so that it can go right to the proximal tubule to be secreted. And the studies that have been done in, on that have not been terrific. They've been discrepant in terms of those results for clinical outcome. And it seemed like something that was really uh, fancy and uh, uh, going to revolutionize treatment and then further studies that kind of washed it out. So I haven't heard of any of my colleagues that have turned to that, but it, it really hasn't been substantiated as a, a, a good kind of modulation of your Lasix therapy. I guess you could argue that if your patient is severely hypoalbuminemic, so again, going back to your PLN with nephrotic syndrome and their albumin is 1.2, and if they don't have a lot of albumin that is going to bind the Lasix to take it to the proximal tubule, perhaps that is one reason that they might not be have a very good clinical response. So the question is, would you give that patient canine or human albumin to improve it? 
I haven't done that. I I don't think that I would personally because of the human studies showing that it's not a profound improvement in efficacy. And if it doesn't work, I just gave this patient a colloid, which, okay, they probably need some colloid because their COP is probably decreased. But if they're already volume overloaded and are now increasing their COP, could that potentially worsen their hypervolemia? Again, I probably am just going to think about dialyzing that patient. If dialysis is not an option, I don't. I still don't know if I would necessarily reach for giving albumin concurrently with Lasix based upon the lack of absolute efficacy seen in people. I don't know if anybody else is, has tried that or heard of that being done, but it's not something I've seen and seems like the um, the glitter from that protocol has kind of started to fade a bit that maybe it's not actually that helpful. I found I found um, a human paper about 10 myths about furosemide. One of those is the uh, the simultaneous administration with with pre, I mean premixed furosemide with albumin, yeah. and the answer to that myth is it depends, and they they claim that in certain hepatic conditions with hypoalbuminemia, they didn't achieve the expected natriuresis, but in CKD patients, they did achieve it. They, they get a better fluid balance with this mixture when the patient was hypoalbuminemic, but then they, they um, talk about this meta-analysis showing that uh, that, that uh, effect is short lasting like 24 hours but this is humans again so I'm, I'm not sure yeah it seems like the if they respond they might diurese a bit faster the overall effect is about the same but they spent a lot of money on the albumin as well too so um, something to think about i again i haven't turned to it but it's not something that I, i've used for any of those pln patients that might need it um, but it's something that is there as another adjuvant therapy to consider. Um, okay, any other questions or comments on this one before we head over and start talking about the furosemide stress test? Uh, yes, uh, this, this paper talks a little bit about diuretic resistance. I found it very interesting. Um, because I found in, in cardiology, in cardiac patients, that they do, they do see some of the same um, lack of response when they use this constant rate infusion. So I started um, questioning myself about my protocol for furosemide delivering to the patients. I used to use the CRI um, dosing. But I couldn't understand very well the theories for for resistance in this paper. Maybe it's it's about some of the transporters. Maybe I didn't get it very well. And I did found uh, two publications from NCS. Um, the same the same group, Dr. Adin, of course, uh, in 2003. Uh, he, he found that CRI is it's better for achieving diuresis, but then in 2018 they found different numbers, so I found it very interesting. But I couldn't understand very well the mechanisms of resistance. Yeah, I think it's multifaceted. Um, you have what they call the breaking phenomenon, and so that's where you essentially will have the kidneys reset themselves, and that's what's kind of shown in this figure four. So there, you will be able to reduce their extracellular um, fluid volume with Lasix, but a new steady state arrives, and the kidneys will adapt to the higher amount of sodium that's hitting the distal tubule, and you get 
a new state, but it's at a lower effective circulating volume, which hopefully is one that your patient is not in congestive heart failure for. Other mechanisms are what's said right above is the distal tubules will increase their capacity for sodium reabsorption. And so they'll have increased number of transporters. Remember, that's where the epithelial sodium channel, the ENAX, live. Um, and they have, they're very soviet, sodium avid. Their proximal tubule is, is a very active place, but it just is basically going to pull off two-thirds of the sodium that comes in, no matter how much sodium goes in or out. The proximal tubule is a workhorse, but it can't really refine very well. Distally is where all the small manipulations can happen. So, and that's the final site before urine is made. So distally, you'll have these increased number of sodium channels that are there, which means that even if you inhibit the ascending limb of Henley's loop, and there's all this sodium that is available for naturesis, and then hence diuresis, distally, if you have more sodium reabsorption, then you could end up with a similar effect. And that is where, when we're seeing diuretic resistance, are we just talking about loop diuretic resistance? Because if they're becoming less responsive to Lasix, then maybe you need to increase the dose, or maybe you need to use a diuretic that's going to affect the distal tubule, or a drug that maybe affects the proximal tubule, like what we saw in that New England Journal of Medicine paper. And you'll likely see that when you start to act on other areas of the nephron, you can see response. So if they were truly diuretic resistant, you wouldn't see any improvement with any of those other classes. Many of those patients are probably just showing resistance to the loop diuretic. But if you were to give that patient a milleride, if you would give that patient uh, metazolone, one of those drugs, then you might see a profound difference in their diuresis because you're going to now work on these other sites that might be preventing your diuretic from working. All right, I think that those were the big concepts we went through um, for this manuscript. I thought it was a, a nice review that talked about pharmacokinetics and how it could be abnormal in our patients with uh, kidney disease, how the toxins can compete for those same sites and why they might not be effective. Um, but let's turn to actually maybe using furosemide as a, a clinical test that we can try to get some prognostic information. So this is the furosemide stress test. And um, this, uh, this author, uh, Lakmir Chawla, is one of the people that have really done a lot of work in this. Uh, their, I think, 2013 paper was one of the big landmark ones that's uh, discussed. They did work back in 2008. So this review, rather than actually pulling out one of those main articles, I thought this was maybe a little bit more helpful as to discussing how we can use this to identify if our patients are having good kidney function or not, and whether or not we actually use it, it again highlights the physiology of sodium handling, the PK and the PD of furosemide, and it just allows us to understand it a bit better overall. Um, so why don't we start any questions before we kind of start chatting through it that people had about this furosemide stress test article that you want to kick things off with. I thought that it's, uh, I, I always like when the drug names are pretty clever. So in case you were unfamiliar with it, the reason that it's Lasix is because of its uh, purported diuretic effect being six hours. So that's Lasix. I thought that was clever. Um, another one that does that is, um, what is it? 
one of the like codeine or something like that is there's another drug that very similarly has like a its name is a play on essentially its effect. I always find that that's clever. I can appreciate. It's always Flomax. <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me laugh. Or yeah. low press. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so this paper just goes and kind of reviews the same things, the, the pharmacology of it, which is uh, the same. They introduce here that the tubular concentration of Lasix, which determines its effect, um, can also be measured by the urine concentration of Lasix, which I hadn't really thought about, but makes sense. I haven't thought about people that can run urine concentrations of Lasix and do you do a spot check, do you do 24 hours, do you do peak? It's a, a different question, but I, I like that concept as a way to think about how effective it might be. We had already talked about table one and the ways that drugs or disease states might impair the efficacy of Lasix and are hypervolemic, oligonuric, azotemic, PLN patients check off many of these boxes that could make it less effective overall. Uh, they talk a little bit about giving Lasix to people with AKI and the risks of ototoxicity associated with it that if it was there in older papers, maybe not so much there in, in newer papers. But one of the things to uh, remember that when we have AKI and we have our cells that are undergoing ischemic and hypoxic injury, one of the things that will happen quite early is your intracellular cytoskeleton, the actin that helps hold everything in place in terms of the cell structure, is also partly responsible for the anchoring of transporters at their various locations. And numerous animal models have shown that when you have AKI, you'll start to have an ischemic state that energy used to maintain that cytoskeleton is no longer as avid, the cytoskeleton starts to break down, and those transporters will move. And you have a loss of polarity. You'll have sodium potassium ATPases along the basolateral membrane that will now float up and they'll be on the apical surface. One of the mechanisms for why we might have a profound polyuria is because now those uh, sodium potassium molecules are flowing the opposite direction on the wrong side of those epithelial cells. And that loss of polarity will reduce the efficacy of Lasix because it's changing that electrochemical gradient of where the sodium molecules are. So another reason yet for why your Lasix might not be effective in patients with AKI. But they introduced this furosemide stress test as a way to identify how well the nephron is working. That if you have a response to Lasix, then you need to essentially have adequate delivery, uptake, secretion, and response to it. So looking at what a patient might do when given Lasix could give you an idea of the magnitude of their AKI and their um, what we'll see, their, their likelihood of progression of disease or recoverability. <clears throat> we have been over this, remember, big points. Furosemide needs to be actively secreted, minimal uh, entry into the tubule via glomerular filtration because it's so heavily protein bound, and it has to get all the way to Henley's thick ascending limb to have an effect, which is probably one of the reasons why it doesn't work. So this, uh, for my stress test, it's a dose of one mg per kg of Lasix if they've never seen a diuretic before or if they've previously been receiving a diuretic, they bump the dose up a little bit more to 1.5 mg per kg. And then they're looking to see what their urine output is. Most of those studies were urine output over the first hour or it could be one to two hours, but it was really within two hours that you were looking to see that there is an increased urine output. So this would be a test that if you're considering doing, you really need to have a urinary catheter in so that you can monitor your urine output, probably have your urine baseline prior to the furosemide stress test so you know how much urine they're giving before you then add your Lasix. And they showed that 
this stress test, so just measuring their urine output after two hours, was very uh, accurate to predict which patients would develop stage three AKI based on the AKIN guidelines. So AKIN guidelines, that would be uh, creatinine that's greater than three or a base um, three times their baseline if their baseline was known. Many of our patients, we don't know what their baseline creatinine is. So it would be a creatinine greater than four, but stage three along the AKIN guidelines is the need for renal replacement therapy as well too. So essentially what this is saying is that the furosemide stress test could accu fairly accurately predict which patients were going to require dialysis. The patients who could respond to Lasix were less likely, and that makes sense. Their kidneys are probably working a bit better than those that did not have the ability to respond. They made sure uh, that, to state that it should not be utilized in hypovolemic patients because Remember, a relative oliguria would be an appropriate response to a hypovolemic state when the RAS system is active, and that's presuming you have normal kidney function to begin with. They then go through all the different scenarios that the furosemide stress test has been used, kids predicting which ones will develop AKI after cardiac surgery. Uh, what I thought was interesting is looking at it compared to other AKI biomarkers, and some of these should sound familiar, because the furosemide stress test was a better predictor of those people that would go on to develop stage 3 AKI compared to plasma NGAL. And there have been plenty of studies in our patients looking at plasma and urine NGAL, and it also performed better than other biomarkers. IGF, BM, BF7, that one I'm personally not familiar with, and then TIMP2 and urinary NGAL, those are other ones that have been evaluated in our patients. So we are constantly looking for those biomarkers to identify active acute kidney injury. We're trying to identify the role and how they might play. And I haven't heard much in, in about this, and it's just an interesting concept to think of. It could be a complementary diagnostic test to see if these patients have the capability to respond. And in people, it, it shows some better prediction than some of those traditional biomarkers. It also has been used to predict uh, which patients were going to need dialysis, and those were patients that were even stratified uh, according to their urine output, which is interesting, but I, I don't think I would personally use that clinically. I don't think I would say, okay, here's an AKI patient, let me do a furosemide stress test, and if they have a positive response, they have a diuresis, we can turn off the dialysis machines. We don't have to use them. And if they don't respond, then let's knock them out to get a catheter in them. I, so I'm interested to see if anyone has ever used the furosemide stress test as a way to get some additional information in their patients with AKI. Um, I, I, like I said, I haven't, used it. Um, I think, I think Karina, I think you've done it a couple times. I don't know if you want to um, give some feedback on your, uh, your experiences with it, but uh, does anyone else have any experience have done it to just to see if, if they'll respond or not? I guess that I have given furosemide to all of your volume overloaded patients. And, you know, it's not that I have, you know, considered it a stress test, but if they made more urine, then I kind of looked at it like, well, that's good. And maybe they're going to do a little better. Um, but it's not been, it has definitely not been systematic. Right. You, I, yeah, I guess you're right. Like, you probably have done the stress test by giving them Lasix to see if they respond or not. And that dose is... In about fact, if not lower than what we would do. Yeah. In fact, I think we did that with Sarge, and I think that he did respond. Of the cases that I've treated recently with dialysis, let me go back and see. Um, and I, I'll, if I remember to do this, I'll report back to you guys. Okay. I, I've thought about it 
doing a retrospective study looking at the efficacy of furosemide to convert patients from oligonucleic state, and our medical records are kind of garbage for to make it easy to search for that. But I think that would be a great multi-center retrospective study to look how often are we seeing a response, and if they respond, does that mean those patients aren't going to need dialysis, or do they? So that patient, Kathy Sarge, that you mentioned, did it make urine after Lasix, and did it end up getting dialysis anyways? So Sarge got dialysis. Um, I can't remember when we uh, gave him, I can't remember if we gave him Lasix or not, but he did go from anuric to oliguric to non-oliguric. Um, and he came in yesterday and he's doing great. Um, we also gave Lasix to Mac, who was making a little bit of urine, but that tapered off, and he died of pneumonia. Um, yeah, so, you know, I've had a number of cases that they've been oliguric, and they have improved their urine output, but that was over three or four days. So I wouldn't consider that a positive response to furosemide. I would consider that renal improvement. Right, right. And I thought it was interesting. They also stated that they used it to predict the recovery of AKI. And I'm trying to think, trying to find where exactly that is, but they show that people that had a response were more likely to have recovery of function. And that was when they were essentially being graduated off of dialysis to see where they would be. So I thought that that was an interesting concept. Again, I'm probably not gonna do it. We don't have catheters in most of these patients. So I probably wouldn't catheterize them just to see if this is going to tell me that they're not gonna need dialysis or they will because I I have other metrics for that, and I wouldn't rely just on this. But it was in it was. It's interesting to see. They talk about using it even for CKD and how well they might be having tubular function with nephron loss. And it is again, it's not something I've I've done specifically to try to prognosticate or to evaluate the severity of disease that patients have, but it is something that has a decent amount of data in for humans. I, I don't think it would sway me too much. I think if they need dialysis and if they respond to Lasix, great, I'm probably still going to dialyze them. Because remember, that making more urine doesn't necessarily mean you've changed GFR. You, know, you you have less sodium reabsorption, so less water reabsorption, but your filtration might still be garbage. So you still might have a GFR of a half mil per kg per minute, but now your fractional excretion of sodium is instead of less than 1%, which is normal, now it's 5%. So you're making tons of pee, but you're still filtering nothing. And ultimately that doesn't change their uremia. Now, if you're aneuric, your GFR is zero. So if you're making urine, you have the potential to have a higher GFR. But I generally, as we said, don't see a lot of those patients respond. So I, I don't think this is gonna change what, I'm, what I would do and how I would evaluate my patients with AKI, but I, I thought it was a bit insightful just to see how it could be used and how actually uh, accurate it tended to be compared to some other metrics that you know, some of the things that we're even looking at some of these biomarkers. J.D., I'm going to have to leave because the apheresis journal club is starting now, but this has been excellent. Thank you, Kathy. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, if there are any other questions or comments, we, I'm happy to hang on for another couple of minutes. We can kind of go through those. I'll obviously throw this recording up on the website for everyone to be able to access and look forward to getting together with everybody next month. I think we're going to stick with this theme a little bit more. I think maybe we'll talk about some overfill and underfill edema for next month's journal club. So I'll send those articles out. But before we close, any other questions? I don't want to uh, shortchange anybody. Questions, comments you had about this or things we haven't got a chance to talk about yet today before we end today's session.
Oh yes, I, I have a question about this concept of furosemide acting as an um, improving tissue oxygen medication. I have read some of that. Uh, do, do we know something about that? I don't know if that mechanism is specifically the referring to the pulmonary changes that you see, the venodilation that occurs with Lasix, because that should improve oxygen transport and you'll have better oxygenation of your blood, which would give you better tissue oxygenation. Or if there's another component specific to capillary beds and tissues, that I that I personally haven't come across. I'm only familiar with the pulmonary effects of Lasix. Uh, there, and there are a couple articles that I can send out that have discussed that, which are pretty cool, which I think people uh, often don't know or they forget about for treating your congestive heart failure patients, but I'm not sure, Caesar, if there was a specific mechanism in a tissue bed. Um, I don't know if anybody else knows. I'm going sh to share with you the, the paper. It's in the same uh, journal, in the critical uh, care pay, uh, journal. Mm -hmm. uh, it says something about the, because of the mechanism, uh, you are blocking the transporter, so you're saving some os oxygen that is not going to be used oh, for the, for the so renal, yeah, to yeah, the yeah, kidney, yeah. correct, okay. but it's just yeah. a proposal. Yeah, so so the, the sodium potassium 2-chloride co-transporter, that is an example of secondary active transport. It's not an ATPase. It's relying on the sodium gradient and it's piggybacking the movement of chloride and potassium along with that. But the establishment of the inside of those tubular cells to have a low sodium concentration is dependent upon the basolateral sodium potassium ATPase. So that's where the energy comes into play. So if you are inhibiting the sodium potassium to chloride co-transporter with Lasix, you are going to stop the movement of Lasix inside the cell, which can downregulate, sorry, the movement of, of sodium inside the cell. That can, will also lead to potassium that will no longer enter the cell as well too, which will effectively downregulate the activity of your sodium potassium ATPase. That Basolateral sodium potassium ATPase, especially in the thick limb of Henley's loop, is one of the most energy intensive processes. That is what generates the ability for the sodium potassium to chloride transporter to work, which is the most important transporter to allow for the generation of the concentrated medullary interstitium, which is what's absolutely required to form concentrated urine. So what's been proposed is that by impairing that system and turning down the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase that will utilize less energy. And for many AKIs that are having to some degree a hypoxic or ischemic component, and that often can be because when we talk about the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henley, that's in the outer medulla. Outer medulla is, an, in healthy states, barely oxygenated. So the partial pressure difference between the oxygen being delivered and what's being taken up is about 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. So it's a very small oxygen delivery gradient there. So that area of the kidney is very, very susceptible to ischemic and hypoxic injury. And then that's where the thick ascending limb lives. So it's been proposed that you might be able to save some of this energy, be able to send oxygen to other places if you're not burning through all that ATP for the basolateral sodium potassium ATPase. And so that's why Lasix has been proposed to be energy sparing to and be able to send oxygen to better places. I don't know if clinically that has ever actually been worked out to be a truly appreciated effect of Lasix versus just doing the math of energy utilization and seeing where each mole of oxygen and ATP goes to. 
So it's always listed as one of the proposed benefits, just like mannitol has free radical scavenging effects. Do we really see that clinically? I don't think I do, uh, but it is amongst the proposed benefits of giving Lasix. I think it's more biochemistry than what we see clinically, but I don't know if other people have appreciated other effects of that. I, I personally haven't. Hey, can you hear me? Sorry, yeah. I had some uh, audio issues before. I just wanted to add real quick, and I know we're running over. I think this froze my stress test has been helpful in the critical care setting rather than kind of the established, you know, creatinine of 10, trying to work out whether it's oliguric or, or whether it needs dialysis or not. So I think it's more, and this I guess is probably where it's, it's, it's how it's used in people, is the patients that, you know, maybe they're post-op or it's a, you know, critical care patient trying to work out, you know, where their kidney function is going. You know, maybe the creatinine's gone from, you know, 1.8 to 2 or, you know, that kind of more subtle um, change. And there I do think, um, and then and obviously their volume status can be very um, hard to assess in those patients. They may be hypotensive. There's a whole lot of things going on. So I, I have found it helpful in this setting. Now, would you use the clinical response in combination with their urine sodium, like proposed here in that table three? Because I think that that, especially if we're thinking about what their volume status might be, I think that might be the way to maximize it, is to do the ferrosamide stress test, but then also to see what's their urine sodium. Because if it's low, then that might tell you, and they respond, the combination would likely tell you, okay, their kidney function is so good, their urine sodium is low, they're probably volume depleted, and that's why they're avidly reabsorbing all the sodium. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think um, when I've had access, you know, kind of ready access to renal chemistries um, that, you know, could turn around yeah. um, in a kind of clinically helpful time frame, yes, I, I did think I did use that as well. So um, I, I think it, um, I, I definitely think it is is helpful in those patients because, you know, I, I think the patient that's already got, you know, a creatinine of five or six or, you know, higher, I don't think it's as helpful in, the, in that situation. They've already got their, their stage three AKI and, you know, then trying to decide whether they need dialysis or not. I think it's, it's more, um, I think it's answering a little bit of a different question and maybe for those kind of hospital acquired AKIs, um, which is often the critical care patient, um, that's, you're getting kind of some early information um, before they get their creatinine of four or five because you know you've messed up their fluid balance or their presser plan or whatever is 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 I think that's where it's been helpful for me. Yeah that's great that's very interesting. Excellent. Well any last questions, thoughts or comments? Who would have thought diuretics would keep us so thoroughly entertained throughout the last hour plus it's a lot of physiology right oh it's amazing yeah. love it love it there's nothing better than renal physiology i was like when you guys were just chatting about uh the mechanisms what happens inside of the tubules i was like just wondering because we're actually like looking for sodium uh sodium um release right you just uh, ex uh excretion so i was like let me check if we have any articles related to fraction excretions or like top sodium such models uh, with patients under AKIs and I just I just could find uh, only one only I just found one paper which is related to not only sodium but many other electrolytes such as potassium calcium and magnesium but it's kind of interesting but nothing related to pyrosomite in the in the scenario but it could be, I don't know, if it could be useful to see if if ferrosamide is acting properly if if you you start looking for an increase of sodium in the urine if they're not anuric, right, or only the oliguric ones are volume responsive. But yeah, 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 and that would be the the mechanism that you would get the diuresis that you would see a naturesis, so they're fractional yeah. excretion of sodium would go up and then the water is going to follow. Um, the problem is with AKI, you often see the fractional excretion of sodium be high 
regardless because you have frac each portion of the nephron is sick to varying degrees. So what's traditionally been used in people as a fractional excretion of sodium less than 1% would suggest that the azotemia is pre-renal. If it's greater than 1, usually greater than 4%, it's intrinsic renal. Even that is not been utilized that much as a reliable marker. So I, I think it would be I think it would be interesting. You almost need to have a urine sodium prior to giving Lasix to be able to, and you can calculate your fractional excretion from that and then check it afterwards because mm -hmm. you don't know if your patient has AKI, you have no idea what their urinary sodium could be. It could be, it could be really high because of their AKI. So you really want to look for that effect of Lasix comparing pre and post. It's very similarly, you could have a UCAT then and see what's their baseline urine output, which is going to be mostly driven by their urine sodium elimination and then see how that changes yeah yeah great point thanks jd of course all right everybody well this was a great session i'll make sure i uh, send this recording up onto the website i'll email everybody when it's posted i'll send some articles for next month and then we will get together i i'll have to double check to see when we are scheduled to meet next month because i'm going away on vacation. So I might have to change the date, but I will let you know in the email. Hope everybody has a great day. Thank you for coming and I will see you guys soon. Thank you so much. See Enjoy.